Welcome to my podcast, Shaping Your Journey. My name is Aldo Matza, percussionist, drummer, and artistic director of Cosa Music, inviting you to join in conversations with friends, artists, professionals, and experts in the music world. Today, I have the great pleasure of inviting, uh, actually, uh, one of my teachers and a great man in, the, uh, in our community, Pete Magadini. Thank you so much, Pete, for for joining us on this Shaping Your Journey conversation. Of course, Aldo. And, and uh, before we, we start t- talking about the journey itself, one thing I have, just, just one question, where did this start for you? Uh, my, my question is like, what was the spark that started it all for you in the very beginning? Okay, so I told myself before we started our uh, conversation here, that I would try not to drag these kind of details out because I've done enough of these and I find that uh, people tend to get a little bored with somebody's uh, quest for excellence if it gets drawn out a little long. So uh, I'm gonna keep my answers brief, but hopefully it'll cover what you need to hear, what you, what you you're searching. Um, so basically, I think like most of us, I was just a drummer all along because my parents used to play me uh, Peter and the Wolf, which was my really big uh, introduction to percussion, and and uh, they had a recording of it by uh, Chostakovich, and they used to play it when I was about three years old. They used to like me. They like to watch me run out of the room when the wolf started coming. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so I really got into it, man. I knew all those instruments and, and all those animals that uh, they represented. And uh, and the next thing I remember, they, you know, my parents were pretty cool, and they they liked to swing dance. So there was a lot of swing music around my my house. I, I was born in uh, Massachusetts in uh, Western Mass, and my dad was in the Army, and so uh, they uh, eventually moved out to uh, California, and uh, when we lived in Palm Springs, um, I was about six, uh, We went. they took me to the Hollywood Bowl, and I saw a snare drummer stand up and play something on the snare drum. Uh, I guess it might have been the L.A. Philharmonic uh, pop series or something. But man, that got me, you know, I, that guy got up and played this snare drum part. And uh, I thought, you know, uh, it was it, it, that little bowl in Hollywood, you know, that it's so yeah. you can see all the players really well because you're sitting up high like a football stadium. Yeah. And uh, I don't know who he was, but man, it, 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 I just said, I have to be that guy. And when I got back uh, home, I was just ready to matriculate into fifth grade. I joined the band, and that's sort of how it started. Marching, you know, the school band. And in those days, they had band directors in the fifth grade and sixth grade because you had to be in the fifth grade to start playing. But there was lots of kids who took up instruments and. Uh, uh, you know, I called that school a little while ago to say. Uh, you know, I started my playing career at, at your school, and they, they they hadn't had a band director or music in that school for forty years. Wow, wow! Um, but I mean, it's amazing. In in many of the conversations that I've had with uh, you know our friends, a lot of them kind of say the same thing. In the in the schools throughout the country, there used to be a lot more. Um, as you said, the educators, but also programming and, and people interested in, in, in even on the grade school levels, orchestras and, and bands. I mean, that, wow, <laughs> that's so, that's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know about Canada, what was going on up there, because, you know, I moved later. I, I went up there to do a master's degree at the University of Toronto. Yes. And um, I don't know how it works in their schools, but in the U.S., uh, you know, when I got into junior high, then I was in a junior high band. And when I got into high school, I was in the high school band yet to take a private lesson or even sit behind a drum set until I was, you know, maybe 16, wow. 15 or 16. But once I did, then uh, 
then I got busy. I started playing in clubs. Uh, I started playing country music in Phoenix. We were living in Phoenix by then. And uh, I, I was a country drummer for a couple of years, and I, I really liked it. Those guys I played with, uh, uh, they had to come and pick me up to take, somebody had to drive me to the club because I was too young to, uh, not to drive, but I didn't have a car. You know, my, my own, the only car we had was the, my parents' car. So the bouncer used to come and get me and buy, <laughs> drive me out to Randy's Terrace in you know, Mesa, Arizona. Nice. It was a rough place, man. But the guys, the guys who uh, uh, I was playing with, I actually have a picture of that band. I, I'll I'll uh, send it to you, and you can maybe include it with this. Yes. Uh, somebody came in and took a picture of, of us, and there I am at sixteen or seventeen, uh, but playing that, that country weird, and but, uh, enjoying it. I, I liked the songs. I liked the artists at that time, and uh, that's how I started playing professionally. I mean, I mean, with all of us, I think, you know, once you're pulled to, to something and I tell, tell everybody, you have to follow that thing that really pulls you. I mean, some people call it your passion, I mean, that thing that you're that, you, that really speaks to you and you just go all in. And if you don't go all in, you regret it. Because well, you teach and you probably have said the same thing to your students. Uh, you know, you ever have a good student who starts talking about, well, I don't know, I got some pressure at home. like. I think I need to quit drums and, uh, you know, get serious about my life. And, and you know, and, and, and I said, you know, I tell these guys, I said, oh, good luck, because you're already that you're already a drummer. It, it's it's in you. You know, you have to do this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, no, know, no, you can stop studying with me, but you're not going to stop playing drums. Don't kid yourself. How many uh, students have you had as coming coming to you for lessons at fifty years old? Well, I've had them all ages, uh, Pete, and, and as right? probably as, uh. as you have. But I mean, you you made me think of one specific. I mean, I have I've had many like that because what happens to you the moment it speaks to you, and the moment you see that you can do it, and the moment that uh, you you're seeing the people around you doing okay and doing something with it, then the question becomes, and actually the pressure becomes, as as you just said. Is are you going to be able to make a living with this? Are you, you know, all of, of those above, those questions above. So there was one, one. Uh, I won't mention his name because he was a, a, a great student of mine. As now he's, I think he's in in the states somewhere doing his masters, but he had just finished uh, his college here, which is CJAP, as you know, and uh, he came to me and he started uh, just taking lessons, just like that, just to augment his own personal interest. And he got really good, I mean, very good, really, really quickly, because, you know, the great students always listen to, to the instructions and do, they do the work, they practice, and they, they're really into it, and they really follow, and, and it get, goes somewhere. And he was really good. Then he comes to me and he says, Aldo, I love this, and, and I can see by the surroundings around here that there's a lot more in music than I thought. So I'm going to take a year off before going to university, and I'll prepare to do an audition in music in one of the universities, I think at Concordia at the time. And uh, so he did, and, and I said, but if you do that, I'm going to design a whole program for you to play, take piano, some theory, the whole nine yards, but you got to do this, and you're, and you're going to be ready. And then weeks later, the parents call me. And asked me if they could have a meeting with me, you know, you know, respectfully, uh, they, they want to support his, their son. But their question, of course, I, I knew I saw it coming. And <laughs> the famous question, uh, is there really uh, is this a real career? I mean, can they can they do something I in this? Can they succeed? Can they take care of et cetera, et cetera? I mean, the two people were one was a banker and one was a doctor. And who happened to be living in my neighborhood. And um, when they came to me, and I, I looked at them and I said, well, you know, I know some bankers who really didn't do well. And I also know some doctors who really didn't do well either. But both of you seem to be very successful, as many are. I also know some musicians who didn't do very well. But I also know some musicians who did extremely well. You know, and I can name you a hundred of them immediately. And I did. And then they went on and said, well, wh what would it take? I said, just like anything else, dedication, you love, you love what you do, and you really become really good at what you do, 
and then you become unstoppable. And you, you love what you do, and you do well. I said, we live in the same neighborhood, right? And I think I did okay. And nobody handed it to me. We work for it, and we enjoy it. I, I love the work. It's a lot of work. But doctors also work hard. <laughs> they do well. So it really, and they said, okay, well, we'll, we'll trust you. And of course, now the, the, the kid is doing super well. And then they came back to me and said, sorry about those questions. I said, I totally understand because, you know, it's our Western society, especially, doesn't talk about that much. And, and it's like, you know, when somebody asks you, can, can you do this? Of course, it's a lot of work. And when I was asked at, at a high school once to present uh, careers in, 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 you know, different careers, and they had a doctor, a lawyer, a, an accountant, myself, representing the music world. So I walked in the class, and I said to, to everyone, I said, question number one, how many people in this room listen to music? Everybody's hands went up. My second question, how many of you listen to music seven days a week? Everybody's hands went up. And I said, okay, so there are careers in music. <laughs> yeah, right. There you go. There, there you, you go. go. So it's, it's, yeah, it's I, you know, I, I kind of just steered clear. You know, you know, Kevin Dean. Of course. He, he was the, uh, when I was teaching at McGill, he was the head of the uh, jazz department. And uh, I was there for a couple of years and uh, he brought me on. I was really, you know, thankful that he did that and and we were sitting in a, in a club one night and he he we weren't playing together but he was a customer and i said you know he said how's it going to school and i said you know what's frustrating is that um you know we're teaching these guys to play music at such a high level but um uh, so many uh of the of what's possible in the future, I, you know, I, I'm I'm questioning that, you know, and I was going around in my head, to, am I, am I teaching, you know, am I back to that? Uh, what we both agreed on is, if you're a drummer, you're a drummer, you know, and I was pitching that to not every one of my college students was going to make it, but, you know, some of them, some of them are better than others, you know, but the the really good ones and. Uh, and I said to Kevin, I just feel like uh, I'm, I'm a bit of a hypocrite because I'm preaching what I love to them, but I don't know if uh, if it's the same. You know, my path is very different. And he said, I said, I, I don't. I, you know, I'm, it's a quandary for me. He says, Well, you know, at this university we teach philosophy. I said, Oh yeah. He says, Yeah. How many philosophers do you know? <laughs> I said, I, I don't know any, I don't think. He says, yeah, well, we have a whole philosophy pro program. And and we have creative writing and, you know, and, and he, he says, it's not your job to, to be there at the other end, you know. It's your job just to do what you do. That's why we have you, you know. And I went, boy, that just cleared it up for me. You know, after that I was, yeah, right, I can't, I can't answer every question you know no no and exactly you say you know it's yeah. it's hard work being a performer but there's a lot of work in music that uh, isn't always about playing the drums that's what we all love we all love back and back but you boom back you know we all yes. love that kind of angst kind of groove you know that some guys play so well and get around the kit and you know all the things that you know, we admire in our favorite players and why we do it because of those guys, a lot of them. But it's one of, you know, I've had maybe a handful of students have, who have become, well, maybe two handfuls now, have become, you know, well-known drummers who right. have, have taken it to another level. And, uh, and I mean, you know, big time players. And uh, that's a hell of a lot of work. Two, we got to move to the cities where the music is, for the most part. And although that's different now, you know, yep. people are doing yep. a lot of stuff not living in New York or L.A. because yep. the studio scenes in those those in Toronto and Montreal, those the studio scenes have changed somewhat. People are recording at their houses and coming up with stuff. And I always tell my students, I said, you know, I said, there's an awful lot of bands out there who are doing well with original music 
uh, and I don't know how good their drummers are, but they're good enough to play in those bands. And all of a sudden I see them on a TV show or a, a big festival or something. And, uh, you know, those, those are all valid. It's, you don't have to go to the jazz club and wait to sit in and hopefully somebody's going to notice you, you know? Right. Yeah. No, and everything has changed so much now, especially with technology. Um, it's like, exactly. I mean, yeah. when we were when we were growing up, I mean, there was music like everywhere around you, bathing in it. Um, but things things change. I mean, they evolved, and and that's not necessarily a bad thing. I th I think you have to have change, and those who are have the appetite or the curiosity change with it. And some people even are ahead of the curve and and help make those changes, right? Um, but I think music yeah. music will always be there in one form or another. And and the, the ultimate question is like like you said, you're just tapping into the, the mindset and and helping them understand what they're doing and enjoying it more because why they're studying that in the first place is obviously they're interested. And whether they come out as we would say a studio musician, I mean that was that's a thing of the past. I think just being a musician and then taking that talent, that transferable knowledge, that transferable talent in whatever, whether it's electronic music, whether it's composing, whether it's performing or all of the above, it's totally fine. Yeah. I, I well, so, so back to the original question is, you know, what's your role in that? Nothing. You know, they make up their own minds. You just, you just, you just do what they're paying you to do. And that's to be their teacher and to be the best best you can be man I, it, there was one teacher in my career that made it possible for me to go on and that's when i was out of high school i got a little scholarship from the high school to study with a really great teacher in phoenix and how in the hell he got to phoenix i have no idea but <laughs> don bothwell man that guy took me under his wing and uh you know he he caught me up and uh after a miserable year at ASU, uh, I went to, uh, I, I drove to New York and I started, I met a young guy who was playing in uh, major jazz bands, uh, you know, Newport Festival and, and all that. Started hanging out with him. He's an alto player. He was a little younger than me. I always think I was 19. He was 17. And we started going to clubs and guys, we would recognize him and invite him up on the bandstand to play. He was that good. And uh, I started playing a little bit around it, and I noticed my playing was up there. I had, I, I surprised myself. I didn't realize there was not too many people in Phoenix that I could get good, good feedback of because they weren't playing at the high levels that they were in New York. But I, I, I said, well, I, I'm, I'm playing okay. You know, I got a lot to learn about tunes and protocol and all that, but my playing was uh, pretty good. And then I studied with Roy Burns when I was in New York. And then, nice. and then he had this fabulous hand method. I, I'm hoping to put it out, the, uh, how that works. Stick control. You always saw, everybody's seen that book. It's a red book. Roy Burns, stick control, Lou Mallon. Nobody knows how it works. It has uh, a, a certain, it, you have to, it, it starts with just quarter notes. But you need to know how it works because it works on the upstroke for a while, getting your hand away from the drum and letting the, because you know, a stick will bounce off the head, but if your hand can't go with it fast enough, then you uh, make it uh, make it impossible for the stick to do what it can uh, naturally do. And that's absorb the energy, give you the rebound back, and then you control it on the down, side of it well everything goes down easy you know gravity makes things go down but getting your hands out of the way was the secret of this mm -hmm. book and then very exaggerated fingers and then you get them real fat and then pretty soon you're into the bounces and man that thing i, I must improve my my technique about 20 percent with him nice so that was cool and um uh, after that, I went back to school at the conservatory in San Francisco, and that's another chapter of, of my career. What made you decide to go to San Francisco from New York, though? Uh, well, because, um, you know, my friend Larry, uh, the Larry Morton, the alto player, said, you should go back to school. 
And I, so I applied to Hunter College because yeah, it's the one I could afford in New York. Damn, I didn't have enough high school credits. You know, you needed a language credit and, a, and another math credit to get in, and I didn't have those. So I went to the junior college in Arizona where my parents lived for a year. And then uh, my teacher, Don, had told me about Roland Koloff. And Roland Koloff was the timpanist with the San Francisco Symphony. And he told me what a badass he is. So I knew I was going into, you know, there was no jazz schools then. Right. You know, you studied percussion. And, uh, and that was fine with me. I had, I had enough jazz studies. And I went into... Uh, went to that school hoping to study with Roland. Uh, at first he wasn't there, but and I was only there about five or six weeks, and then he started becoming the teacher. And I stayed with him for two and a half years, this master musician who became the tippinist for the New York Philharmonic for 31 years. He just passed away about uh, uh, eight years ago. And, uh, yeah, that was a... And he kept saying, I love your percussion playing, but you're a drummer. That's your thing, you know, <laughs> right. which was very cool. You know, he used to come out to gigs. Every, I played a gig with Art Pepper. I was so nervous, man. It was like my first chance to play with a, a name artist, you know, one of the first. And uh, there was a club in uh, outside of San Francisco. They used to call me to play with their artists. And the, the first one was Art Pepper. And, and Roland came out to hear me do that. He says, yeah, you sound really good. I said, oh, thanks. You know, as soon as he said that, I was like, okay. Because I know I know what this guy listens to. He's a perfectionist, you know. Right, right. But he was also a drummer. He played some drums. So I sent him, I sent him in to sub with me at the uh, for me at the Playboy Club once <laughs> to play the show <laughs> on drum set. I told leader, I said, yeah, I'm going to send somebody in. You're not going to believe who I'm sending in, but I think it'd be fine. So, okay, I'll try to. <laughs> well, a lot of the a lot of the great timpanists were really good drum set players. I mean, Vic Firth, Louis Charbonneau. Um, I mean, many of those guys played drum set. But and it's funny because in the back all of their Goodman minds, all Goodman students that you mentioned there. Sorry, all Goodman students. Exactly, excellent. You you knew that uh, Saul Goodman actually taught in Montreal at the conservatory. I did know that, and and he, you know he told me once that Louis Charbonneau was one of his brightest students. Exactly, exactly. He named four, three or four guys, and Louis Charbonneau was one of them. Yeah, well, he could play. Yeah, he was oh. he was badass. Yeah, you know he's one of the great timpanists who not everybody knows, but he used to sub for. Uh, for Vic Firth in the, in the Boston Symphony often. But here, I mean, he was God here. I mean, he, was, he, he later became the teacher at, at the conservatory. Uh, and a lot of, I mean, Montreal was a funny place in, in that regard because you had the, the Goodman School that was established, and then you had the Delicluse School of, of yeah, Paris yeah. that mixed here. And then you had guys like Pierre Belleuse and Guy, Guy Lachapelle. Uh, who are like uh, incredible players who mixed all of that knowledge and all of that uh, um, mindset that the, the mindset of, of the percussionist and the the affinity that finesse of, of, of playing. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, there's things you get. Hey, Steve Gadd studied with John Beck. John Beck's the teacher at Eastman School of Music. Steve Gadd has this beautiful technique, you know, beautiful finesse, beautiful touch. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I think a, a lot of that has to do with studying uh, with classical guys, you know. Um, yeah. No, for now, sure. Now, some and, of and them you... can be hard-ass, but they're usually not the better players. I had one of those in Arizona, and uh, he couldn't play at all. Man, he, he, he froze when he, got, when he had to play something for somebody. I say, well, let me hear you play it. Well, I couldn't play it. I said, well, how you, why are you telling me to play it like that? You can't play it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got one. on to him after a while, you know. And then they had an audition for the uh, symphony, for the timpani part, tim a timpani chair. And he auditioned. And the local pharmacist got the gig. 
Because, <laughs> you know, you were talking about guys who still are playing but went into another field. Right. So obviously this pharmacist had spent time studying Timpani. Yeah, so, you know, I, I always tell students, you know, if you're, if you're suspect about a teacher, ask mm -hmm. them to play what they're preaching. Yeah. You know, and then, then you can at least either agree or not agree that that's the best approach. But if they can't play it, what the hell? They didn't pay their dues. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's true. I, I wanted to take you back a little bit because I remember, uh, I mean, when, when you were in Toronto, I, I studied with you and I, you know, of course you recommended to me and, and, and I had looked you up and you had played with people like Diana Ross. Um, how did that come about? Was that just an accident or okay, you played well, with from, it for a while? From San Francisco. In San Francisco, I was playing with George Duke. Right. We went yeah, to school right. together and we had a trio and we got a gig in a club called the half note and Al Jarreau became our singer. Nice. So you can imagine, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Tony Williams and, uh, Wayne Shorter, when they were playing up the street at the both end on the Visadero, they'd walk down and, and sit at a table. And, and when they were in town, they'd spend a couple of evenings listening, you know, boy, that'll get your attention when those guys are there. But, you know, it's flattering to think that you're playing, playing at, at such a, a high enough level that that interests them to come down and hear, hear what you're doing. Uh, not not me necessarily, but you know George Duke became. Uh, I knew he was a genius from the beginning. You know, brilliant. And yeah. um, so I got busy in San Francisco. I was playing. I was the house drummer at the Hungry Eye. I'd been playing the Playboy Club. I'd done the thing with George. I graduated from school. I was teaching at the conservatory, but the Hungry Eye closed. There had a brand new theater in Giardelli Square. It didn't work. They closed. And that gig went south. And so had our bassist, John Hurd, and George. They both went down to L.A., so I shortly followed them. And so I got down to L.A., and Bob Yeager at the professional drum shop put me on the teaching staff with um, Joe Picaro and, um, and Chuck Flores. It was the three of us. And that was, that was you know, my, one of my first students was Chad Wackerman. Wow. Nice. And, and I had a couple others like that. But one day I was at the shop and, and uh, Bob or somebody said, uh, Diana Ross is down the street auditioning drummers. Pete, you want to go? And I went, yeah, I got my stuff in the car. I'll, I'll go. So I went down there and I went to the audition and she was up on the stage with her conductor piano player. And they just ask us to play a bunch of stuff. And I got home, I got a phone call, I got the gig. So I auditioned for her. And, and, and you know, uh, this was 1969, 70, I can't remember. And uh, I think there was a lot of pressure on her not to get a, a white drummer, you know, just because there wasn't that many, you know, black artists, now she was going out solo, but she made right. this decision. And actually, if, if you watch her through the years, her bands have always been mixed, you know. Yeah. She's never she's been colorblind that way. And I always gave her credit. She just she just goes with what she hears. And she she's got great she got great pitch and uh and she's uh terrific time. She was easy to play for because I mean once you got she and I had a duet we did where she danced and I played, right? Just the two of us. Okay. I wish we had a recording. Of course, I never thought about it then. But uh, we did that every night, and, and it always she was always dead on. I never had to worry, and I, I, I think she thought that about me too. You know, I never had to worry about her slowing down or getting faster, or you know, I never got a note going. Oh, the time doesn't feel right on this song. You know, I never, right. we, we never at the rhythm section, we never got that from her. But if we were having a, a little off couple shows, we'd hear about that, you know. <laughs> yes. you know now, she, I remember she, seeing her and, live. And with, with, with so the... She'd be right on, you know, like we were, we're, you know, we got, we went a little flat when we were in Las Vegas one of the times and, and a couple of shows were like, man, we couldn't find it to save our lives. And uh, we all got a message in a rhythm section that Diana Ross would like to meet you 
guys in her uh, dressing room. Well, at the front frontier, the dressing room was a big, long house trailer home. And uh, it had, a, you know, bedrooms and a butler and a bar. And so we knocked on the dressing room door and the, the butler guy or whatever he was, the guy who oversaw her, let us in. And then she came out in a robe. And I really thought she was going to say, you know, I'm going to have to let you guys go because uh, we can't have shows like this. And I, I wouldn't have been surprised because... You know, we, those couple shows were just, we couldn't find the handle. The bass player and I couldn't find, uh, couldn't agree on the time anymore. And uh, right. so she said, you know, guys, she said, I'm tired. I know you guys are getting tired. I'm tired too. She says, not only do I do this show, but when it's over, I got to fly back to L.A. right after it. Because tomorrow I got two recording sessions I got to do or a TV special or I'm on somebody's show. She says, I hardly get a chance to sleep. She says, can you guys just tighten it up? I mean, oh, yes, of course, you know. And after that, man, we never we never had a bad show after that, you know. Yeah, but that no. was her reprimand. Could we tighten it up, you know? So we all felt, wow, this chick's got a lot of class, you know. So yeah, that's nice. I don't know. That's later nice. on, I hear she's a little difficult. But then she, she was she was new at it. We were new at it. And... Um, yeah, she Motown, was... Motown would come in every so often and listen to a show and change a number or something. But basically, once it got going, it was the same thing all the time. And we traveled all over. She put us up in the best hotels. We flew on the planes that she flew on. We had our own car. We never had any rules about how before the show you have to show up. You know, one night I forgot. I took my music back to the hotel to look at something. And I got to the show in Vegas, and I got there with about five minutes before curtain. And I went over to my music stand where the music usually is, and there's no music. <laughs> nice. So I had to play it from memory, and uh, damn, I, I remembered most of it, no problem. You know, maybe a couple of spots, but after that, I didn't need music anymore. So it was the best thing that ever happened to me because. Now I could play it from memory. And then, you know, when you play things from memory, uh, you play it better, you know. One thing about drummers these days and, 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 and all days is a lot of them concentrate so much on the drums, but they don't concentrate on what, what tunes they need to know or what styles they need to know. You know, when you sit down with a band, they're going to play something, and you should know at least what the form is if nothing else, because otherwise you're just wailing out in the dark, just producing beats like a metronome, and you're not really right. contributing to the music. You know, jazz drummers, the good ones have a large vocabulary of what you need to play and what you, the forms of those tunes and where to put fills and how the fours work or how the form works or what style, when does it go into Latin? When does it go back into straight? Uh, all those things are critical to what we were talking about before to be a professional drummer. Yeah. Because when you sit down, you better have some pretty good ears. And uh, one thing about studying uh, in a classical school, and I'll end with this, is that one of the reasons is I just want to keep improving my ear. And, you know, when you play timpani at a serious level, that it's all about your ear because those damn things have to be tuned <laughs> into <laughs> another key while the orchestra is in one key, you're tuning, tuning to the key that's coming up. Yeah. And you might only have maybe eight or, or nine, ten bars, to, if that, to change two, three, four drums, all by relative pitch. You don't have time to – those gauges don't work all that, that well then anyway. So, you know, you had to use your ear. So it, it really improved my ear. And, uh, you know, in, in having a good ear doesn't mean you're good at sight singing or you know how to take dictation. I mean, that's a good ear, no, no question. But as you know, as a player, it's just having those tunes in your head, you know, because when somebody plays one, you know it yeah. and they yeah. know you know it. No, and you're, you're absolutely right. And, and, you know, I was very fortunate to study with a guy like Pierre Belleuz, who just drilled it into me. I mean, playing timpani was one of the great things, and just playing melodic. And he, 
you know, he kind of drilled into uh, all of us that the importance of nuance, the importance of sound, and we'd, we'd search forever for that right sound. And then I got to be a bit of a maniac myself. And it really helps because when you're playing drum set, and I even tell my students, even the cymbals, those are notes. Those are not just things you hit that, that sound like metal. They are actual notes, and they're, each cymbal has how many variety of, 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 of nuances and, and tones that you can pull out of them. And if you think uh, playing drums like you're playing a, a vibraphone or a piano, then you're playing music. You're not hitting things. And uh, rhythm has, has melody. And that's you should always be thinking melody. And, and so I think studying classical uh, really helps, you know, especially when you're playing drums because you're playing melodies. I mean, Harvey Mason was another one that comes to mind. Steve Gadd, as you mentioned. Yeah, there's a, there's a guy, Harvey Mason, New England Conservatory. Yeah, 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 yeah. He went and, through my book, uh, Polyrhythms, one, another one. Uh, Jeff Watts, Harvey, Harvey Mason, Steve Smith, uh, some of the top players I found. that Because they used to teach, the teacher there used to teach out of that book. Those are required. Uh, I wish I could remember his name. He, he taught a lot of great drummers. At the New England Conservatory. Frank Epstein? No, no. Uh, he was a contemporary of Frank Epstein's. He he, he was the drummer for, for the Pops concerts. Um, I can't remember who that might be. But that's a, right now, that's but a great book that you wrote, by the way, that, uh, I mean, a, a lot of people have used it. And I think I have three, three different versions of it because I wore out the first one. And then, of course, you know, you, it falls apart and it's... Very well thought out. <laughs> yeah, know? it's the same book with three different covers and two different titles. But I only wrote two books, but they have this one. This is my more most ambitious book, Polyrhythms for the Drum Set. Yeah. And this takes you into polyrhythmic independence. And... Um, I'll find you one of the solo pages here because it demonstrates a lot. But it's a it's a great book to break down and learn. Yes. Now this is quite advanced, but here the 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 pattern bass drum and 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 left hand snare drum is in six, and the rhythm above is in six, but we're in four. One, mm -hmm. two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six. So the, all that is in six over the four. Here, this middle section is in four, but the ride symbol's in six. And here's in four again, and the ride symbol's in six. And you can see it's fairly complex. And to play this independently, you have to work up to it. But what it gives you is this ability to now play, you know, there's, I'm gonna be brief on this. There's four, four time, and then there's six over four, which is one and a half times faster. And then there's double time, that's a polyrhythm, twice as fast. And then under here we have three against four, four, five, six, seven, eight. Four, four, one and a quarter faster, one and a half times faster, one and three quarters time faster, double time, and three quarter to one. So I, the question comes up, why do you need to know these? Okay, here's my answer that after all these years, if you're driving in your car and it's nighttime and there's no other lights except your headlights and you're going down the highway, you kind of have to just stay in the lane you're in. You have no idea what's on the right or the left. You know, you're just kind of staying where you have to stay because it's dangerous otherwise, right? Right. But as you learn how to play in these ratios, the lanes on both sides begin to open up. And now you can see this whole highway or here, the possibilities of what, even if you're just in your lane, just knowing that you can go a little bit this way or a little bit that way, or actually shift over into this time field. And, you know, Elvin was a master at it. You, you couldn't have this conversation with Elvin. He probably wouldn't know what the hell you're talking about. But he knew it. He <laughs> right. did it anyway. Because it's there. It's I didn't invent this shit. Sorry, you'll have to bleep that out. 
you know, it, it, it's it's there, yeah. and you become such a strong player. I don't care if you play jazz or funk or anything. You're down the middle, becomes so strong because now it's yeah. a big wide down the middle. It's not a little narrow one. Yeah, and you that's know, a whole Africa. That's a whole African concept is a pulse. Yeah. and the the whole variation of yes. interpretation around it. No, no, and and I tried this. Not unlike you, I tried to stay away from. A, a, identifying, oh, this is Indian and this is African. I tried to stay away from that because that was a another whole thing that I, I wasn't an expert at, at all that. You know, I studied African music with Russell Hartenberger and I got some of it down and, and I studied uh, uh, Timbales with Willie Bobo's top student uh, and sub in, the, in San Francisco. I'm a pretty good Timbali player. And, uh, you know, I, I, I appreciate Latin and Brazilian and all that. But all this is generic. You can take this concept and just play sure. it, use it. It's, it all happens in your head, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, but and, what, I, uh, what I really appreciate, Pete, is, is the – and you wrote this book a long time ago. I mean, it really – it helped, certainly helped me understand, you know, um, how to drive that uh, on that lane. And then down the road, when you had to break things down, how to really understand it, having uh, uh, your pulse at, at where you're sitting, basically. So you, you did a really, uh, really nice, I remember that book, was it green or orange book, the original? It was green, yeah, green. the original one. Yeah, the original was, one was green. Yeah. The, this one is, the other the polyrhythms, the, the regular polyrhythm book is uh, Musician's Guide to Polyrhythms was called, and now it's called Polyrhythms Musician's Guide and then there was two two versions of it, and they put it into one. So it's you got everything. But you know, I learned that from studying tabla, and the tabla teacher ta taught me about time ratios. And once I got that together, I said, "Well, how are we gonna how are we gonna learn this with our music? We don't we don't have a syllable uh, system, right. you know, like the Indians do. We don't have da din din da da din din da teriketi. We don't have that." And uh, the Africans, it's not written out. You have, you've got to have a, a musicologist to go in there and record it and then trans. So, uh, but he taught me about time ratios. And once I learned these, you know, time ratios, these, um, then I was simple. I just used quarters, eights, triplets, and sixteenths from our system. And I put them into four, four, one and a half. A one and a quarter, one and a half. Now, one and a quarter is five over four. That's a hard rhythm. When are you going to play in five over four? Well, hardly ever, although guys are doing it now. Uh, but it is very delicate because it's between one and a half. You know, so you have, you know, and this is very common. Boom, 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 bop, 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 boom. You know, you know that from Latin music that and is very African. But this one that fits in between one, here we go, and I hope I can do it. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. That five is delicate because it's right in there. But if you master that, you're you're talking about fine-tuning your cymbal sounds, the fine-tuning your rhythmic sounds. Sure. Sure. Are you going to use it? It doesn't matter. No, don't use it. You know, don't use any of it, but you'll be a better 4-4 four, four player. Sure, absolutely. And More solid. feel it. People, I had a guy tell me in, in Chicago, he says, you know, when I play with you, I play different. And I thought, this is a jazz piano player. And I went, you know, that's a nice compliment because what he's hearing is I'm just giving him, he just hears the options that I'm presenting, I don't, I'm not playing them, but he can hear it in my 4-4 playing. He can drift off into something. He doesn't even know what he's doing there for sure, rhythmically, but it's working because I'm hearing it and I got his back, you know? I, yeah, yeah. No, no, that makes total sense. Absolutely. The, the, the one, one other thing that I wanted to, 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 to ask you about, I, and I remember this well when, uh, when I was studying with you, uh, going to Toronto on a regular basis, is uh, I mean you had a, a great system of teaching by the way which you know did help me and I'm sure it helped others who worked with you, but you had you were a bit of an inventor also you I remember you came out with a, a bass drum pedal. pedal. 
Yeah, the Brico pedal. I remember that clearly. So it's it's you nice. Want to see that, one? Sure, sure, sure. Let's let's see it. I have one. Let me hear. I think it's right here. No, I remember the. Uh, it was a big, great, a really big board that was movable. And you know, I think what what happens in in many of us who uh, who are creative, uh, we move around in in the creative, not just in the drumming, but in in the instrument or or things to solve our, the issues that we think are problematic, and, and we solve them for ourselves. And yes, with the rod on the side, yeah, nice. So the idea here was, go ahead, I wanted you to finish what you're saying, though. No, 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 it's, it's, it was, uh, I, I said everything I had to say, but you had, you came up with this, you know, expanding your, what I call the creativity, the creative, and whether it's playing the drums in time or, or a, a structure of a tune, there's also the logistics of things. Um, you, you know, I've, I've come up with, uh, over the years, many ideas that I've finally, because of COVID, I was able to patent them. <laughs> finally oh, yeah, after good, the years. Good. And they're coming out. I mean, there's a bunch of things. One, Manhasset is coming out with a, a, ma a mallet stand. And, you know, some other things that are coming out soon, I can't talk about it right now because it's actually yeah, right, right in the middle of it. But it's that creative. And, and you're always creative in that regard as well. It's, let's well, show the, the My dad was a structural engineer, so th that guy was... Uh, <laughs> you'd go to the beach and he'd build you a, a hotel out of sticks and logs. You know, he was that kind of guy. And... Uh, so I might have got some of it from him, and he was my partner in this. So basically, here's the deal. The rod is like an extra leverage, right? It's like, you know, if you have a boulder and you need mm -hmm. to move another boulder, you stick a stick under and get some leverage. And, and so you can change. This is the only pedal you can actually change the leverage. Not only could you change the... Uh, the uh, 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 the resistance spring. yeah. with springs, but you could change the leverage. Man, it got a lot of attention. I was selling them and dealers, but here's what happened. This darn thing right here. Now, this is the last one we had, the thickest one. This is gymnastics cable. That swedge would eventually, for some players, break. Guys write me today, they still have my pedal. I never had it ever break and but i couldn't even have it break for one guy you can't imagine i couldn't imagine a guy on a gig just bought this pedal for 150 dollars which is a fair amount of money when this was came out in the 70s and uh, and we couldn't figure my dad's an engineer we had and let's say why didn't you use a chain in the sprocket because Don Lombardi had a patent on it, and he wasn't letting anybody use it until the patent ran out. These are all DW parts, except for that. You know, we were buying a lot of our, our parts from DW, but they wouldn't let me. So I was stuck with this. And it made so much sense that even DW, for a minute, went to the cable themselves. We talked about that once at a NAMM show. He said, you okay. know, we went to, I said, I know, I saw the ad. I said, yeah, we didn't stick with it very long. I said, yeah, <laughs> right. And they had a little thin cable. We kept beefing it up. So anyway, you know, this adjust, you can adjust this. You know, there's a lot of things on this pedal it could do. I, I still believe in it. I, I mean, now if we put a chain on it, I think you'd have exactly what it should be. And it would be a, a pedal that would be a contender of some of, of some sort, I think. But, you know. Sure. That's no. a lot to get that thing off the ground again, you know, because oh, there's yes. Yes. all kinds of stuff you got to do and patents and machining and patterns. And uh, yeah, yeah, that's people do it. So, yeah. so, anybody out there wants to talk about recreating this pedal again, let all or myself know and how I'll put, put you in touch with me. Yeah, no, no, of course. I mean, you're easy to find, of course. And and that's one of those great ideas that could have, I mean, it's it's like the original uh, 
sprocket pedal. It was uh, Frank at Polito in New York. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I I have two of those pedals, by the way, because I used to study in New York regularly, and I used to go to the shop all the time. And one day oh, he's been young. Yeah, I was. <laughs> I was small and young <laughs> and I spent a lot of time there and and um he said we're we just we're developing these pedals this is before DW of course and uh and I have two of those pedals that that he transformed from the Gretsch pedal uh yeah it was Steve Gadd who turned me on to that because he that's what he had at the time when in New York back in the, in the 70s late yeah it's mid late 70s something like that yeah, I I know that that was revolutionary, and uh, I, it seemed like Frank Eppolito kind of lost out on it somehow. I, I I never did find out or pay much attention to the details of that, but yeah, that that, that pedal I think put DW on the map. Sure, I think. no, no, they they took it over was... and uh, and they went to town with it, and they they went crazy. That's that was their whole basis of the drum workshop. And then Don, uh, and then everybody just went crazy with that. And and I think it takes a lot of tenacity, a lot of ingenuity, a lot of um, dedication, you know, as you know, in these things, just like playing, just like music, you know. <laughs> yeah, my idea was to just get it going and then, you know, I'd be back playing all the time and it would sort of take care of itself. But you're right, you know, I had to go to some NAM shows and, Although I met a lot of people, uh, a lot of people knew me through my book, which I didn't realize. And I went to Lenny DiMuzio gave me a, a Stilgen uh, endorsement right away, you know, and I was there for the pedal. <laughs> and I met the Colados. Uh, they let me show it in the booth. You know, I here's the sad part. I shouldn't even tell you this story. Big Firth picked it up, and I just had this prototype there, and he was still not a big company, but I knew Vic because I was at Tanglewood in 68 and we became friends. Mm -hmm. And I knew that he was somebody to be reckoned with. He said, Peter, let me have this for a while. I'll do something with it. I said, Vic, I'd like to, but you know, we're shooting for another drum company that needs a drum pedal. And we, that, that, that's who our focus is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jesus well, if Vic would have figured out how to fix it. I'm pretty sure. Oh, you know, for sure. Vic, he Vic was a Vic. Vic didn't didn't let anything uh, that I could see beat him from playing difficult percussion parts yep. to dealing with uh, problems with his company and manufacturing and all that. I went to the uh, Boston Symphony uh, uh, dressing uh, uh, rehearsal stage, and I, I, at the uh, entrance there was. Uh, mailboxes for all the players in this orchestra so i just wanted to say hi to vic and uh i wanted to see if maybe they might be having a rehearsal that day I happened to be in boston for something and uh i said to the uh the guy uh, who was uh, the, the security guard i said um is vic firth here today and he, he said uh, no he's not here today i said oh i want to leave him a note but i don't see his mailbox here he says, oh, his mailbox is there. And he pointed to the floor, and there was like two big bags of letters. Wow. I said, how often does he get these? Oh, about every week. And I know Vic, he would have answered every one of them. They wanted to know about his sticks, because remember he was making classical drum sticks? Yes. I had I had some original pairs of his. And uh, they were like the best, you know. If you if you were going to play classical snare drum, you had to have big, big first sticks. And he was and, just getting the stick thing going, man. And, yeah. You know, it looked and, like and, to me like, well, he's going to have to stop this. How can he play in the orchestra and take care of all this at the same time? But right. he did it. And here's the here's the funny part that I learned only much later, that um, when Vic Firth's original drumsticks were actually made in Montreal, because Louis Charbonneau turned him on to the place where he was making his sticks, contemporary. Uh, the, they were contemporaries, and they're both making uh, drumsticks. I still have the originals myself, timpani and uh, snare drumsticks at the same time. And um, the original ones were actually made in the same place that Louis was making them in Montreal. 
And then, well, and then you know, it, that, that doesn't surprise me because uh, we went to my wife's French Canadian. Yes. And Fran- uh, we went Francine, to an event. Right? What's that? Francine. We went to an event uh, with Vic. Uh, he came up to the Bay, Bay Area for something uh, about 10 or 12 years ago. And uh, maybe a little longer. How long is when did Vic pass? Uh, mm, maybe 10. Uh, huh? Maybe 10 years ago or something like that. Yeah, it sure. So it would have been about 12, 15 years ago. And then I introduced my, he had a Canadian wife too, for a big. And I introduced him to Elan and uh, he said, oh, wow, French Canadian. He says, you know, French Canada, French Canadian in Quebec that has a lot to do with my drumstick manufacturing. And he said, uh, as a matter of fact, there was an old uh, French uh, woodworker who taught me a whole bunch of things about how to make the stick, you know. And uh, yeah, he was he was quite um, uh, grateful that he had known these, uh, you know, French Canadian uh, uh, craftsmen up yeah. in uh, uh, lower Quebec and upper United States. Because I think <laughs> he made them in Maine, right? After, the well, after, yeah, afterwards from- it was Maine and then around, yeah, in Maine. But originally they were done here, and then when he got bigger production, um, then he he moved his operation down there, and, and then he bought the, the 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 factory, and I mean the, the rest is history, of course. Um, I mean he was he was a very another creative type that um, you remember he he came out with um, uh, these uh, kitchen. Fruits, wood. Oh yeah, fruits. yeah, yeah. Kitchen, kitchen implements, uh, salt shakers and pepper mills and spoons and yeah. So, I, and I asked him once. I said it was amazing. You've got. I said this is the best pepper um, grinder grinder that I have ever seen. None of them ever work. Yours does. And I said, but Vic, how? How? Like, where does this come from? And so he said, no, it's a funny story because. He said, my, he said, you know, my mother was Italian and she spent a lot of time in the kitchen doing yeah. all of these things. So uh, when I started getting interested in the woodworking things, uh, which was the sticks, et cetera, then I decided to make some things to, to complement the kitchen. So he had this whole, whole other thing going that none of us, I don't think, had any idea of. But he was, it was huge, right? Yeah. Yeah, are they still doing that? I don't know. I never. I I, I am not sure. I not, I didn't follow that, but I remember having that conversation and laughing because I had this and I, I and I saw an uh, an article in the Gazette at the time on a Saturday paper. They did a, an article on these shakers and and um and, and and then it said you know made by this manufacturer it was a stick manufacturer and I so I called them and I said Vic how, like. Where did this come from? <laughs> that was fun. And this is what I'm saying about the creative, you know, whether it's drumming or music or, or anything, it's still the creative mind that takes you in this in, in all of these places. And it's fantastic. Yeah, well that gets back right back to what we were talking about originally. Yeah. You know, who knows who knows what's gonna happen? How is this gonna influence your life? Exactly. Me, I, you know, this is what I do. I mean, I never did anything else, period. So I always try to play as at the top of my game and, and, and um, because of my percussion background, I think my attitude towards playing all styles of music um, became uh, prevalent because I, I never just, I never considered myself a guy who only played jazz or only played funk or only played country. I, I, I like to think if I'm playing it at that time, you think that's all I play. Sure. You think that's all I play. That's my goal. But it's not what it's that's not true because I can switch and you know I'm a switch hitter, and uh, and Good that's term. that's made it easier for me to you know get a lot of work that uh, maybe some guys can't do. And also, you know, although, as you know, man, everybody has to get their reading together. I don't know why that's such a problem for a lot of students, but they still rebel. Reading, I say, yeah, you want to be the best reader in the band if you can, if you can swing it. But you won't be because the lead trumpet player is probably going to burn you on that or 
you know, somebody else. If you're in a band that's reading charts, but the thing about reading charts means that when you get good at it, reading is your best friend. Yeah. I just put the, ch and you're playing along and you're playing the tune. Never heard it before. And you sound like you've been playing it for Sure. Six and it makes months, such a difference. You know? I mean, I mean, you want to do both. I mean, you, you learn the, the music by ear, and, but that's like a language. And in music being a language, you le first learn uh, to hear it, to play it, and to speak that language without writing it. But at one point, you get to the point where you have to, otherwise you cannot trans communicate that idea to someone. Uh, you can't read it if somebody sends it to you. And, and, and then you get so limited. I mean, as you know, you can go in and, and read a show blind. And I've done it hundreds of times where I've never seen the music. I, you know, I, I, was, I was reading really well. So I'd go in and I'd just read the show blind. And yeah. sometimes even on, on major stages. I remember um, doing a show with Andre Gagno, a, a great pianist who had a lot of hits here. They called me like three days before that the percussionist uh, couldn't do the gig in, 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 at the Kennedy Center in, in Washington. And they said, well, here's the music, um, and there's no rehearsal, you're on stage. So I just read the show, and it was like everything. <laughs> yeah, well, but if you, if you can't read, you can't do those things, you know? Yeah, if you can't read well, uh, you know. Yeah. I mean, a lot of guys can read well enough to get through a rehearsal, I suppose. Yeah. But and it's like reading reading anything and, and interpreting it, you know what's on the page and at the same time you're you have your chops together you know the music and it's it's it totally enlarges what you can do as a musician is it necessarily absolutely essential no but the more you can read the more you can interpret it makes you a much more interesting person in a in a conversation and actually being invited to that conversation the gig Right. Yeah. No, no, I mean, you said it well. I mean, I, I, that's super important. You and, know, uh, one of the things, uh, so when I got to Toronto, uh, John Wire and Robin Engelman were both the teachers at the University of Toronto. So that was the start of Nexus. So I walked right into that, which was great. Man, they had all those instruments and all that percussion stuff that they were – Ready and and you know they won an Academy Award shortly after that group was uh, they did the soundtrack for uh, somebody who skied down Everest and and they won an award for that. Right, uh, that was Nexus and Nexus just took off, but they were playing with the Toronto Symphony, and because I was going to school there and I had my uh, percussion background, they started using me as extra percussion with the orchestra. Now, there is a reading, uh, you know, you're almost always sight reading and it's terrifying because you got a conductor up there. You don't know who he is and who he's going to, if you mess up, he might rake you over the coals, you know, and uh, you just don't want to make a mistake. That's, that's just out of the question. And uh, under that pressure, at least in a recording studio, they can do they can do take two or take three. You know, you can still be reading well, but hey, maybe you need another run, another run at it. That's that's perfectly acceptable. But in a symphony orchestra, they don't have any take twos. It's like here it is. It's now or never. You do it. You want to work the next gig? You better do well this one. You know. And those guys in orchestras, they get so relaxed with it. Oh, man, they just make it look so easy. But I, I'm glad I had that experience because yes. uh, when I was doing a lot of studio work in Toronto, and the Toronto musicians are really good, man. You know, those guys aren't kidding around. And uh, especially in the studios. Yeah. And yeah. so, uh, you know, all that experience really, really helps. So, it will, you know, if somebody asks you to read a show, and it's not paying as much, as much as you like. Well, if you don't have a lot of experience in reading shows, maybe you better take it, you know, just to see what that's like, because it's not all about usually just reading the music, as you know, you gotta put things down and grab things and what do you do here? And they know what well, they want a wood block and they want some other stuff and how are you gonna choreograph that? And 
you know, yeah. there's a there's a, an art to that too. So oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, but, you know, that's not the glamour side of playing drums. That's the money side of playing it, you know. Occasionally, also, I'll go to a show, and if a guy's playing really well, I'll stick my head down in the pit and say, yeah, man, sound beautiful, you know. He's all surprised that somebody was listening, you know. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. But it's also a lot of fun, too, because it, the challenge of, of, like you say, chore the choreographing of, of, of it all uh, and sometimes it gets pretty hairy, especially in those some of those musicals, that uh, it, it gets pretty hairy. I, just as a challenge of being able to be awake, a one step of one step ahead of everything, and and remembering, and how to how do you set up to make it all work? It's, yeah, uh, it, so true, so true. You know, I did Les Miserables in Montreal. Remember, it was in Montreal. Yes, yes. I yes. played that show on drums. And the drum part was also kind of a percussion part. But they told me, they sent me the music way ahead of time, and they sent me a tape. And they okay. said, don't pay attention to the setup on the score because the pit in Montreal is going to be too small, so just make it work. So I arranged the drums and thought I had a pretty good handle on it. You know, I couldn't hear from the tape. It was like a on the road version of the show. I mean, it was the show, but it was taken. Somebody made a tape of it in the pit. You couldn't hear much and it was kind of confusing, but I got, I got the gist of it. We started rehearsing in the, uh, in the uh, uh, foyer because they were still working on the set. And we were we rehearsed for about a week and a half. And then we moved the whole thing down into the pit. And we started doing run-throughs from beginning to end. And in the middle of one, in, in, at the intermission of one of the one run-throughs, the contractor said that the conductor and the conductor from New York want to see you in the hall, <laughs> see you in the auditorium. Oh, Christ. What the hell? So I went out there, and they went, you know, Pete, uh, we kind of blame ourselves. Because, and I started hearing that, and I was like, oh, no. Oops. I, mean, I, had, <laughs> yeah. I had canceled work for a year. It was nine months, and, uh, you know, I, I was, like, putting it, all my eggs in this basket because uh, it paid well, and, but it, it took, you know, eight shows a week. And uh, they said, we normally invite a new drummer to go, come down to New York and sit in the pit and listen to the guys play the show so you know how the setup is because we're not hearing the sounds that we're used to. I said, oh, so what are we going to do? They said, well, we're going to bring in a sub from New York, and he's going to set this thing up right, and then he's going to play it for a couple days, and if you can get it together by then, then you got the gig. Oh, man. Wow. Wow. They took everything that I had put, you know, all the choreography and set the sticks down here and tunings and all, changed it all. It the rototoms were here and the, the, the lower drums were over here and uh, all the accessories and everything was just in the, And plus, where I had the stickings all worked out, they didn't work anymore. And there were some numbers in this show that were really demanding. You know, the battle was one of them. It was like one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, one, and all on. Like that, you know. If you get lost, okay. you're, you'll you never get back. Mm -hmm. you never get back. And uh, although I practiced that thing until three in the morning, <laughs> and then he'd play it, then I'd play it, and he'd take notes, and... Then he'd play it, and I'd have some questions, and I'd play it. And finally, it came down to dress rehearsal, and he was supposed to play the dress rehearsal. I was supposed to play the rehearsal. I said, man, play the rehearsal. I'm going to do the dress rehearsal. I wanted to hear it one more time. So that night was dress rehearsal, and uh, I got through it. You know, I got through it in three and a half hours. And uh, <laughs> I, had fine, I put it so I... I, I <laughs> I, I tested myself to the limits, man, because sometimes I was going, well, you're a professional, just make it work. 
Sure, sure. Yeah. Now, that's a great story. That, that reminds me of uh, one summer, I was still a student. Pierre Belus comes into my studio, I was practicing. He says, what are you doing this summer? I said, well, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. You know, it's just, it's just cancel it. I can't do this gig. They're hiring the musicians in Montreal. It's the original Broadway production of Fiddler on the Roof with Five-ish Finkel and all of these people. The conductor is Anton Coppola, the uncle of Francis Ford. And it's a two-month tour. Here's the number. Call the contractor. You're doing it. Bye. Ah. <laughs> so, <laughs> said, sounds like... And I had done, you know, a, n a number of musicals before, so he knew I had, you know, I had the experience of musicals. And so... Everything was done. I flew out to Vancouver for the rehearsals. And I but when they told me how much money I was getting, I couldn't believe it. I said it was yeah. I was hallucinating. I said, That's yeah. that's incredible. They must have made a mistake. Yeah. I said, Oh what whatever. So I flew out there and I and, and I see two books, the drum book and the percussion book. And you know, I'm used to going in early and setting up and you know, making sure I'm set up. So I said, Okay, which one am I doing? All the gear was there. So I said, well, it's Pierre Belleuse being my percussion teacher. I must be doing the percussion book. So I set up the whole percussion thing, you know, the bell, the timpani, uh, xylophone, you know, everything. The conductor walks, walks in, Anton Coppola. He's like a little Toscanini. And I introduced myself. I said, I'm Aldo Mazza, you're percussionist. Um, I... I uh, I'm in early and I'm all set up, but who is playing the, the drums on this? So he looked at me, he says, you are. <laughs> I said, oh, I'm not playing the percussion? He says, no, no, you are playing both. And that's why we have two extra rehearsals. Whoa, yeah. I said, okay, now I get it. So I had to wow. set up and it was like I was playing they drum do that. set. Why is they do that to percussion so much? It's unfair, man. You know, they think, you know, you get really good at doubling up and then and then they triple you up, you know, or something. They do oh, that. That was amazing. So he says, so we'll have to like we'll have to integrate both because some of the parts you can't possibly play xylophone and drum set going at the same time. So we'll have to figure out what stays, what goes as we go along. So here's the whole the whole first rehearsal would be, we'd stop. He says, Aldo, measure 42, play the timpani. I need that symbol there. Take out the xylophone part. So we'd be doing that all along. And so I, and I was 360. My setup had to be 360. Yeah. I, oh, I, yeah, I, man. That's... <laughs> so it was like that for, for the first three. Well, we had two days of rehearsals. Intense. And then... This whole thing about stopping, at the end, I said, oh, my God, the, before the opening night, I, I'm, I'm in the elevator. Some of the people from the uh, stage were there. Five-ish Finkel is there, who was, remember Picket Fences, that show him. And uh, Ian Finkel's father, by the way. So these guys, you know, I'm saying to one of the guys, I said, I don't think I can do this. This is crazy. I I can't remember half the stuff. I'm going bananas. So the other guy said, "No, Aldo, you're doing you're doing great." And the guy says, "Oh, Fivish Finkel says, oh, so you're Aldo." Uh. <laughs> I said, "No." Uh. <laughs> so I, my name became part of the show because in 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 the this is the funny part that had, that scene came on so often that we were rehearsing Aldo do this do this so we did, did all the changes. So during the show, there's a part where the in in the in the actual show where somebody they're looking for a name to name the child. So they're looking through the book and they're going through names, you know, and, and Jacob, David. Aldo. Yeah. So they added Aldo to the name every night. At opening night, they're going Jacob, Jacob, David, Aldo. And I mean, I was like, the orchestra fell apart for 10 seconds, you know, because everybody's wow. laughing. Yeah. So yeah. the whole show, I had to live with that because they would do that every night. <laughs> yeah, that happened to me once. I, I was playing with this group uh, in uh, uh, Toronto, I guess. It was a regular just stage play, and I knew some of the players, and they had come to Montreal, and they put the stage play, play on. And uh, so I'm just watching the show. It's not a musical or anything. And, and one of the characters says, so where were you today? And the, and it's a packed theater, right? And the other character says, oh, I went over to Pete Magadini's. 
I was over at his house and they you they said that on stage, right? And I was like, wow, that's me. I was like, I couldn't believe it. And I looking around, of course, nobody's laughing or anything. It's just a name to them, but yeah. <laughs> nailed yeah. me with it, man. I I thought, oh, you guys are good. Yeah. It's funny. So and- um you know, I went to Chicago, uh, so I moved, moved back to Bay Area. I played in a, a nice little trio, jazz trio, for about 13 years at a jazz, at a restaurant. And then I moved to Chicago with my wife, and our son had been living there. And I, and I hung out there, and I got to know some of those players. Those are some great players in Chicago, man. They are some yes. great players there. A lot of them don't have the national reputation as New York players. For whatever reason, I guess they just don't have the uh, the uh, publicity that. Uh, well, sure, New York, are. New York takes up all the, uh, you know, everything. Yeah. But I stayed there for six years, and then I moved here to Boise, and now I'm teaching at Boise State University. Ah, nice! Congrats! I saw I'm you in Chicago. Associate percussionist yeah. and uh, drum set teacher. Nice. So well, I got a work. university position late in my life. But it's been uh, just perfect for me. And uh, so we're out here in the country. Uh, Chicago was getting a little uh, dicey. And uh, not not the music, music scene, but the politics were getting out of hand. And uh, as they still are, I think, somewhat. You've been and, moving around quite a bit. And that that's very interesting. I mean, coming up through Toronto, and then you were in Montreal. You taught at McGill, at Concordia. Then you went to... Uh, um, the West Coast, and then I I was doing a clinic in in Chicago, and and you came to the clinic, and I it was oh, nice right. to see you. Yeah, right, right, yeah. right, right, the, right. The Chicago right. Drum yeah, Show. Uh, t- Chicago Drum Show. I yes. remember your clinic. Absolutely, yeah, it was a good one. Yeah, Chicago Drum Show. I had just released my uh, my book, uh, book, Cuban Rhythms. That book right there, right where I'm looking at it. Yes, yes, and. You know, in Cuba, the Ministry of Culture actually accepted this book as an official textbook for the Cuban music schools, which oh, was, nice. uh, you know, it's like winning a Grammy. That's nice. Yeah, it's nice. My wife and I went to Cuba. We went to Havana for three months, uh, three, uh, three months, for a week in 2003. Uh, that's, that was another eye opener. I took some lessons there, too. That was great. Um, and you had, remember you had given me a name early on when I started going there. I can't remember his name now. Yeah, but that's I, who I'm trying to think of. That's the guy I, I studied with. Um, and I looked him up and I actually invited him. And, and he didn't show remember. up, right? Yes, yes. No, he came out. Oh, he did? Yeah. Yes, and, and I invited him. I can't remember his name now. David something. Yeah, David Pimento. Pimento, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yes, yes. I haven't seen him um, since then, but this this was a long time ago now because I've been. Yeah, like, I don't know why he was playing really well drum set with this band, um, uh, Mexla, I think what they were called. Right, right. Uh, my wife and I caught him in a club, and uh, wow, I mean, he impressed me because he was playing drum set, but he was playing the Latin off the drum set, you know. And that's exactly what I wanted to study with, you know, somebody who was doing that. Yeah, I don't know why, man. He had it all going. I, I but that's a funny place, Cuba. That's well, you know, you there, you you know more about it than I do. But yeah, and I was just there for a month. I mean, it's it's such a, a cultural uh, heaven, you know. I, yeah. Yeah. Musically, artistically, it just it's just so nice because everybody understands you. <laughs> you yeah. know, that's it's the thing. Too bad that people don't have any money. Well, I mean, you know, that's that's a whole other question. But yeah, I, I mean, well, sixty bucks a month is not a hell of a lot. Yeah, you know. but I mean, they do have. I mean, they do have other things. That, that they do have, have other to, things. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's that's a whole other discussion. Which I mean, that's that would be a whole other book and a whole other week. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but anyway, I wanted to, I wanted to just ask you. Besides getting the um, position, because how far are you from Chicago now? Oh, thousands of miles. I'm closer to I'm closer uh, I'm closer to Seattle. 
Ah, okay. Because I, I yeah, I'm, we're we're up we're up in in the northwest. Okay, okay. Because I I missed that that part. Yeah, interesting. So, I mean, if you have a reputation, so wherever you go, I mean, you do what you do, right? So, I'd... well, the nice thing about this gig is I finally got a chance to use my master's degree as as part of the. Uh, application process you know you have to have a graduate degree to teach at this school right, and, right. Uh, a lot of schools that i had applied before before uh, when it came down to the jazz departments they were just picking the flavor of the day and it didn't necessarily mean you had to have although you know i taught at mcgill and concordia for many years and uh, right which was great i had great students there and joanne blondin was my student right not not at those schools. She stayed with me privately. She was a waitress at Charlie Biddle's club. Wow. And one of the bartenders said, Do you know Joanne there? I said, Yeah. She plays drums. I said, Oh, really? So I was playing drums there off and on. And I said, You play drums? She said, Yeah, I've been meaning to ask you. You think you could take me on as a student? I said, Sure. So she started as a student. She stayed with me for a couple of years. Now she's playing in uh She's in demand, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. No, she's a great, great player. player. Great you know? player. And yes. did you did you know um, uh, the drummer? Um, uh, if I don't remember his name exactly, it's not going to make it sense. Uh, Pierre. Um, he does a lot of recording stuff, and he played with. Um, it wasn't Dantel, but it was a, like one of those stars, and. Um, Uh, you can't remember. Anyway, he, 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 he became a real, I played, uh, I played something he played for, uh, uh Steve Edelson, who was within with the Yamaha yes. and he up here played, uh, one of, uh, Dave Weckl's, um, music minus one, uh, right. book and tape, you know, and a uh, very difficult, uh, piece and, um, uh, not spur of the moment, but one of the other ones in seven, eight. And Steve said, I've heard this a hundred times. I had never heard it played better. And I said, really? I said, wow, I'll tell Pierre. And he was thrilled, you know? Nice. So nice. yeah, the Canadian guys, uh, Paul DeLong was my student too, you know? Right. Yeah. Way and he's, he's still out there. He's yeah. got there, you know, but, uh, listen, I, uh, appreciate the fact that, uh, <laughs> You've kept me on so long. Hope we haven't lost everybody. I but. mean, you have you have influenced a lot of uh, a lot of people, Pete. And I do want to thank you for for joining me today and, and sharing some of these uh, experiences, some of these thoughts. And you know, because what, what's important is not necessarily what we've done, but th that process. What what drives us to, what decisions we make that takes us to to certain places. And end up where we end up, you know. And, and these are decisions, and and people opening doors or or thoughts that come to our minds, and you just follow your path, right? And you shape your journey, right? Yeah, yeah, couldn't be put better. Yeah, yeah. and you've done that. <laughs> You're amazing. Well, thanks, Aldo. I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. And and as I, as I always say, to be continued. Okay, good. <laughs> I like that part. <laughs> All right. Okay, man. Take care.